Good afternoon, New York. Good evening, uh, Europe. And welcome whatever time of the day or night it is for those joining us from around the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, IGMG, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining this our second in a planned series of webinars on multi-generational legacies of exposure to nuclear radiation fallout. The first, Daughters of Hibakusha, address some aspects of the intergenerational aftermath of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. Today, we pick up events that followed. The 315 nuclear tests that took place in the Pacific area between 1946 and 1996. Three major nuclear powers, permanent members of the Security Council and colonial powers in the area, the United States, Great Britain and France, contributed to this lasting assault on the Pacific peoples and their environment. Today, 8 November, is the anniversary of, uh, sorry, is the anniversary of the British Grapple X test, Britain's first chemo nuclear explosion in 1957 at Kiri Timas Island. Following the ICM GLT style, today we have a multidisciplinary international panel to discuss these events and their multi-generational consequences. Your moderator is a clinical psychologist, victimologist and traumatologist who has devoted much of her career to treating, preventing and studying multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights and to reparative justice. Ambassador Amatlane Kabua is a distinguished diplomat who is the Republic of the Marshall Islands permanent representative to the United Nations headquarters here in New York. Roger Clark, speaking from Philadelphia, is a noted international lawyer who recently became emeritus after teaching at Radcliffe's Law School for nearly five decades. He's also a member of the board of the ICM GLT. He was part of legal teams representing Samoa and later the RMI in proceedings in the International Court of Justice involving nuclear weapons. Glenn Alkele is an anthropologist who was a Peace Corps volunteer in the RMI. He teaches at John Jay College of Criminal Justice here in New York. Sue Roth, joining us from Scotland, is a social scientist, an expert on human rights protections and decolonizations and on the epidemiological aftermath of nuclear testing. She was for several years the New York representative of the minority rights group at the United Nations and was subsequently on the faculty of the medical school at the University of Dundee. Nabil Ahmed is an architect by profession with a doctorate from the University of London. He is a professor in Trondheim, Norway and joins us from there. Among his many interests is seeking means of proof of human rights violations and of the nascent crime of ecocide. We have about an hour and a quarter for the webinar. The sequence of speakers is as follows. Ambassador Kabua will offer her perspective as a citizen and representative of a country whose territory underwent many of the early texts. 
Roger Clark will then offer an overview of the tests chronologically, those in the RMA, what is now the Republic of Kiribati and French Polynesia. He will also offer some comments on the movement towards independence in the Pacific, including ultimately membership in the UN. Glenn Alkalail will then share his expertise on the tests in the Marshall Islands. Sue Roth will talk about the British test in Australia and then in Kiribati. Nabil Ahmed will discuss his understanding of the legacy of the French test. Each will talk for about seven or eight minutes. Then we can have a little time for interchange among the group. And after that, I'll open the floor to questions or brief comments from the full of experts, virtual audience. To conclude, panelists will have a the opportunity for last words. Please use the chat function and we will do our best to respond to as many of you as we can. Feel free to direct your question to a particular panelist or to all of us. I give the screen, the virtual floor, to Ambassador Kabua. Ambassador. Thank you. Dr. Danieli for organizing today's important meeting. I wish to also thank the fellow speakers today. It is important that we are gathered today to reflect upon multi-generational legacies of nuclear testing in the Pacific. In the Marshall Islands, we have long realized that the impact of nuclear weapons testings are multi-generational. These are vital contemporary issues and also ones which our youngest and future generation must address. These tests have created a legacy handed down from mother to daughter and father to son in our bodies, our lands, and our waters. I suggest that the English language fails to accurately convey our full experience. It is also fitting that we are having our discussion today in the context of the United Nations. It is true and rightful that our primary focus remain upon the role and responsibility of the United States, which conducted these tests. And not just one or two, but 67 atmospheric tests between 1946 and 1958 at a scale which was equivalent to 1.6 Hiroshima size shot every day for 12 years. In addition to the role of the United States, however, was also the United Nations. The Marshall Islands was part of the UN trust territory of the Pacific, which was defined as a strategic trusteeship overseen by both the trusteeship council, but also the security council. The United States was named as the administrating authority for the UN and was entrusted by the UN with our well being, safety, and development. These tests in the Marshall Island remain the only known instance where a, human, a UN body ever explicitly authorized nuclear weapon detonation. Twice, Marshall Island representative petitioned the UN Trustees of Council to stop objections, while also assuring our health and compensation are for loss, as expressed in UN Trusteeship Resolution 1082 in 1954 and Resolution 1483 in 1956. We at Marshallese delegation who travel we had Marshallese delegation who traveled to New York to present this petition in 1954 and in 1956. And I think from any perspective, everyone should go now be able to acknowledge this decision to proceed as a grave and horrific mistake. Our petition, however, caused quite fuss at the time. Our islands were 
on the front page of every newspaper in the world. Our words at the United Nations rang through every capital. Eventually, our military concerns. The partial test ban treaty and our marshals to stable nuclear risks. Nuclear tests were banned in the atmosphere and, and water. Yet the Pacific continued to struggle with the nuclear testing for decades to come, including in French Polynesia and the Kiribati Islands. My call today is not to give you a history lesson, but the details are important and deserve your close audience. In fact, many of the records of our national victims tribunal have recently been permanently archived in Switzerland. So humanity will forever know our suffering. We have requested a clear, precise, formal apology from the United States, and we are entering bilateral negotiations to ensure our loss is adequately addressed and the clear responsibility for the nuclear legacy is addressed. We also reflect upon the important visit of a UN Human Rights Special Rapporteur in 2013, who outlined roles of the Marshall Islands, the United States, and the UN system in better addressing nuclear victims. To help carry this forward and serve as an effective advocate, our government has recently created a National Nuclear Commission to coordinate efforts. Yet we have also not entered into agreements which would potentially shift primary responsibility away from the United States. Instead of only sharing the experience of our suffering today, I also wanted to provide this as an example of how the legacy of nuclear testing in the Pacific is not just a legacy of humanitarian tragedy, but also one of bravery, resilience, and empowerment and our legacy as Marshall Island in influencing the wider international community long predates our becoming a UN member state in 1991. This coming January, the parties to the non-proliferation treaty, the NPT will gather in New York at the United Nations. We will also do so under a cloud of tremendous global uncertainty and the voice of the Marshall Islands will remain as we have been for decades as a powerful global reminder to the United Nations that despite the difficult politics, no nation and no people should ever have to share our difficult burden. Thank you and I thank you and for Maltada in Marshall Islands. Thank you again, Ambassador. Uh, Thank you for your overview and thank you for your passion. And we are all with you in this. Uh, Roger, will you please uh, unmute? Slight technical problem there, but we're unmuted. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to uh, Ambassador Kabur for that, that very powerful uh, statement. Uh, it, it's also a great pleasure to be here today with some old friends. Uh, Sue Roth, Glenn Alkal and I go back to the 1970s and 80s at the United Nations Trusteeship Council. We sought there uh, to move the then trust territory of the Pacific Islands to a fair self-determination accompanied by United States cleanup of its nuclear mess, which the ambassador has made uh, uh, mention uh, of. And, and also we work for the preservation of the Republic of Palau's nuclear free constitution. Yael and I worked from the 1980s on victims issues at the United Nations and then the creation of the International Criminal Court. And those victims issues have come back again in an important way in the Treaty on the uh, Prevention of Nuclear uh, Weapons, Articles 
six uh, and seven. Nabil is a new friend, a vivid reminder that the torch is passing on uh, as people like me become emeritus. What a strange situation to be in. But there's a new generation coming along, a new generation possessed of new skill sets, of which Nabil is a wonderful example. Let me underscore that number that Yael mentioned, 315 nuclear tests between 1946 and 1996. Stunning. The Australian scholar Nick McClellan, who I believe is on today's call, has recorded the history of many of these atmospheric and underground, underground detonations in his terrific 2017 book, and let me get the title right, Grappling with the Bomb, Britain's Pacific H-bomb tests. A link to it uh, has been put up uh, by the uh, uh, webmaster of, of this event. Nick's grappling in, in the, the uh, title is a wonderful pun uh, on the British grapple tests, uh, which gave us the occasion uh, for this date, uh, November the 18th. Uh, November the 8th of 1957. Mm -hmm. The 315, of course, includes, as we know, tests in the Marshall Islands uh, in what is now the Republic of Kiribati, formerly the Gilbert Islands colony of Great uh, Britain. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the 193 tests in Mararoa and Whangatoafa in the land uh, that the French insist on calling French the Polynesia. Some of those tests took place in Australia. Australia is an outlier uh, in this, as Sue Roth has talked about in, in her writing, in that the government of uh, Australia was an enthusiastic uh, part of the British nuclear testing program. On, on the other hand, the indigenous people of Western Australia who were exposed to the experiment were not asked their opinion, and of course, the non-self-governing peoples of the Marshalls, the Gilberts and the French territory had no chance to say no. It is no surprise that the major indigenous Pacific operations, the activities, the whole enterprise indeed, called itself the nuclear free and independent Pacific movement, a body which is yet to receive all the academic treatment that its significance warrants. As this multidisciplinary event should indicate, different disciplines formulate responses to phenomena in their own discrete manner. Mm -hmm. As an international lawyer, I saw events in the Marshall Islands, particularly as a breach of the trusteeship agreement to which the ambassador referred. Under that agreement, to which the United States owed its legitimacy as an administrating power, it was obligated, and I quote, to protect the inhabitants against the loss of their lands and resources, end of quote. Irradiate them, obliterate them, was that a way to protect the lands and resources? The actions of Britain and France could also be characterized as breaches of the more general provisions in chapter 11 of the charter, the declaration regarding non-self-governing territories, which asserted that the interests of the inhabitants are paramount. The interests are paramount by irradiating and obliterating their territory. The webmaster has put up a book chapter uh, that I wrote, which I invite you to uh, read if you have time, uh, which describes three efforts uh, to craft proceedings in a manner to command the attention of the International Court of Justice over these matters, using three distinct but related areas of international law. The first was to argue that the French testing in particular constituted a breach of emerging customary law norms on the illegality of testing and on the protection of the environment. 
The cases to this effect brought by Australia and New Zealand in the court in the early 1970s demonstrated how many International Court of Justice judges see nuclear issues as toxic to their own professional life and thus best avoided. They managed to dismiss the Australian and New Zealand cases as moot when France made an arguable promise not to test in the atmosphere anymore. Having characterized the Australian and New Zealand cases as involved merely with atmospheric tests, a dubious premise in the case of the New Zealand uh, uh, argument, the court held the case moot as France, La France, would be true to its words. It was true, and it stayed underground for another couple of decades with the remainder of its tests. The second case was a creative effort in the 1990s to have the court declare in an advisory opinion that the use of nuclear weapons themselves is dangerous to human beings and illegal, particularly as a breach of the laws of armed conflict. I was honored to participate in those proceedings on behalf of Samoa, which formed a consortium with the Republic of the Marshall Islands and Solomon Islands to present a joint case. The highlight of that proceeding was the testimony of the late Lijon Eknalan, who described her exposure on Rongelab Atoll downwind from the March 1954 Bravo hydrogen test, a thousand times the size of the bomb that obliterated her Marshallman. I quote a little from what she said. It began to snow in Wangalap. We had heard about snow from the missionaries and other Westerners who had come to our islands, but this was the first time we saw white particles fall from the sky and cover our village. They played in the snow. She continued, my own health suffered. I cannot have children. I have miscarriages on seven occasions. I'm taking thorough medication, which I need every day for the rest of my life. She was about my age, but I wasn't exposed uh, to nuclear testing. I'm still here. The court stopped just short of holding the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons was per se unlawful but it insisted unanimously that there is an obligation, particularly on the nuclear powers, to negotiate in good faith to rid the world of such weapons. In 2014 to 2016, the Republic of the Marshall Islands endeavored in the ICJ to enforce that obligation of the nuclear powers. I was again privileged to participate as part this time of the RMI team. But the effort founded in an evenly split court over the arcane procedural issue of whether the RMI had a dispute on this question, notably with the United Kingdom, India, and Pakistan. Dear friends, the 1972 Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment introduced to environmental law the concept of protecting present and future generations, a matter reiterated at Rio in 1992, and again in the preamble to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. I trust this webinar is a useful contribution to further exploration of that concept. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. As always, totally teaching and passionate at that. Glenn, would you please, uh, you don't need to unmute, uh, please join us. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'd like to share um, a very short um, uh, PowerPoint and uh, just kind of give a quick little history here. Uh, hang on here. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. 
This is the beginning. Um, I call it Atomic Atolls. And the story for the Marshall Islands really begins after uh, the dropping of the two atomic bombs. This is Hiroshima. This is Nagasaki. And then here we have the Marshall Islands. Now, um, for the first year after we dropped the bombs in Japan, we collected all the data. We knew exactly how much uh, damage could, could be caused to a human, you know, 400 meters from the epicenter of the overhead small atomic bomb. It was small. Uh, in those days. So we had all the, all the data from the acute direct effects of radiation. We had zero data about radioactive fallout that was going to come with the larger hydrogen thermonuclear bombs that produced large mushroom clouds. So for the atomic bombs, uh, the, ato the uh, mushroom clouds weren't such an issue. But if you see the bottom paragraph here, it says here, um, US government had no data about radioactive fallout and its impact. Enter the Marshall Islanders. So here are the Marshall Islands in the North Pacific, uh, just above the equator. They're cousins to the people of what used to be called the uh, Gilbert Islands, Kiribati. Um, they're ethnically very similar. They're like cousins. Here's a blob of the Marshall Islands. Uh, in particular, here's any we talk in bikini. These are the two atomic uh, nuclear test sites. Um, it's important to realize that the winds, they're called the Northeast trade winds, they're very consistent. They always blow from Asia and then they blow eastward in an eastward fashion from this direction over to the islands. It's important to remember that. Now, the story for the Marshalls begins a, a year after the end of World War II when uh, Commodore Ben Wyatt flew by seaplane to Bikini, met with the Iroj, the chief, this person on the left, his name was Iroj Chief Judah, uh, he met with him, asked his people if they would kindly give their island over uh, to the U.S. The U.S. had designated that they were going to use Bikini Atoll for nuclear testing. Uh, now, it's important to, remi to, be, to uh, remind ourselves that the people of the Marshall Islands arrived about 2,000 years before the present. They've been there about two millennia. So they were given about three weeks to, to get off the island in preparation for Operation Crossroads. This is the first series of tests in 1946, the summer of 1946. Uh, Roger Clark uh, told us about the signing of the UN trusteeship agreement. It's important to understand that this test here that you're watching occurred one year before the US pledged to the international community to protect the health of the inhabitants and protect um, their, their environment. That was in the trusteeship agreement signed one year after this bomb took place. Now, in 1949, the Russians, the former Soviet Union, succeeded in getting their first atomic bomb, named after Joseph Stalin. It was called Little Joe. So in 1949, the decision was made to push ahead then, because the U.S. always wanted nuclear superiority, to push ahead with the second generation of nuclear weapons. These are the hydrogen bombs and the thermonuclear weapons. What you see here, this is, at ni this is 1952 on NEWTOP. This is a prototype hydrogen bomb. It's actually not a bomb, it's a building. And just to give you scale, if you see the cursor down in the lower right-hand corner, these are the people, just to give you the scale of how big this thing was. Now, this thing over here uh, is where the lithium deuteride liquid form was stored. So this was a giant refrigeration unit to keep the uh, fuel, the hydrogen fuel in this thing here called the sausage, by the way, uh, to keep it below room temp. If, it, if it, it was at room temp, it would volatilize, it would explode. So they had to keep it below room temperature. So that's what this building was. It was a proto-hydrogen bomb. Now, this is what it looked like when they exploded it. And you can see the size of it was uh, 750 Hiroshima bombs. That's huge. So this was the first hydrogen explosion, but not a bomb. It was not portable. It couldn't be put into an airplane dropped on an adversary. Now, what the US was looking at, what they were fearful of, if the, if the former Soviet Union had succeeded in getting their hydrogen bomb, and if they dropped it on Washington, DC, the prevailing winds would have carried the radioactive fallout up the eastern seaboard here, where about 15% of the US population lives uh, it would have knocked out our capital, would have gone to New York, all the way to Boston. This is Edward Teller. He was the designer of what, what came to be called Bravo, our first deliverable hydrogen bomb. This is how he designed it. This top part is your garden variety 
uh, atomic bomb, the type of bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In a hydrogen bomb, um, this was used as a trigger, a detonator to achieve the fusion, the heat and pressure necessary to fuse this red stuff, this is the lithium deuteride that in 1952 had to be kept below room temperature. In 1954 for Bravo, the success was it could be kept at room temperature and not volatilized. So this is the second part of a hydrogen bomb here. This red stuff, by the way, is what produced 80% of all the radioactive fallout from Bravo, 80% of it, just in that red stuff there. This is what Bravo looked like. This is Bravo, uh, our largest hydrogen bomb. Uh, this was about a thousand Hiroshima bombs. Uh, and about three years after this bomb was dropped, it was, it was declared that we were still receiving plutonium, cesium, americium, strontium-90 falling from the sky from this particular bomb. A, a Japanese fishing boat got caught uh, in the Bravo fallout. It was called the Fukuyamaro Lucky Dragon. It was here. It received the highest amount of fallout. Now, this chart shows where the fallout was distributed from Bikini, the epicenter, ground zero, went all the way to Utrecht, which is 310 miles away. Now, imagine from New York City to Boston, that's about 300 miles. So if a bomb was detonated in midtown Manhattan, people in Boston, 300 miles away, would have gotten the fallout, just like the people of Utrecht did on that fateful day. This is, this is what the fallout pattern looked like. And this is from an Atomic Energy Commission. This is from one of their films. They were very concerned about the fallout from Bravo. Uh, they superimposed Bravo's fallout on the Eastern seaboard just to simulate what it would look like. Uh, these are the acute effects of um, uh, exposure to high level radiation. It's called epilation, hair on the head falls out. Uh, this is what's called a beta burn. From your hydrogen bomb, you have three big isotopes, three problems with the radiation, alpha, particles, beta, and gamma. These are beta particles that produce beta burns. Now, there's question about the wind. Uh, this is the man who was the head weatherman for Bravo. He claims the wind did not shift as the US has continued to allege that that was the cause of Bravo's distribution of fallout on downwind uh, inhabited atolls. This man was measuring the wind with 27 fellows. He claims that there was no wind shift. That's another story, by the way. Um, and this is for Sue Roth, our Australian, uh, Neville Shute, an Australian author, caught wind of Bravo, made a very important book, made into a movie called On the Beach. Uh, these boys uh, received high level fallout from Rongelap. The boy on the left received a higher dose, obviously. Um, iodine, radioactive iodine, I-131, is responsible for his stunted growth. It's called cretinism, dwarfism, or hypothyroidism. Uh, many babies born to the, uh, genera the first exposed generation looked like this, too many babies. Uh, now, the U.S. would say, well, you know, we have babies like that in Bangladesh and Nigeria. The problem is not as many. We just saw too many babies for a very small population following the nuclear test. Uh, in 1985, uh, the people of Rongelap decided to abandon their home. They felt that it was too dangerous to live there. Um, Senator Jetton Angine was the one who made the decision to move. By the way, he uh, won the uh, very prestigious Goldman Environmental Award in 1992. And then uh, the, the year later, he passed uh, in 1993. We lost Jetton Angine. But this is why the people of Ronglep decided to abandon their home in 1985. This is Carol Bolkin. And the people there, I was part of the operation, told me, they said, you know, we're living in a dangerous place. We've got to get out of here. We keep having babies that look like Carol. Now, currently, this is uh, on any we talk. This is called the dome or the tomb. It encases a lot of radioactive contaminated soil, but the real story is not here. This is the, the image that's caught the eye of the international media um, and activists. This is not the problem. This contains maybe 2% of the, of the uh, uh, contaminated soil. The real problem we found out is that hundreds of barges, tons of radioactive contaminated soil from the Nevada test site were barged 6,000 miles across the Pacific, ended up in the lagoon of any we talk over here. So the real problem is not here. The real problem is in the lagoon. This is Ellen Boaz. She's showing you her Brookhaven medical card. If you look closely at her neck, you can see where she's had her thyroid gland removed here, a, a late consequence of exposure to fallout. Uh, now, the marshals um, uh, in, the, in the first compact 
Compact of Free Association that was signed and, and voted on in 1986 contained a little secret called Safeguard C. And I'm hoping our ambassador and the uh, compact negotiators will follow up on this. Safeguard C was placed into the original compact, which said that at any given time, the United States has the right to resume nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. So I'd be curious to know if Safeguard C made it into the current compact, uh, something very much worth uh, investigating. Uh, now, the United States in the compact designated um, uh, some remediation for the nuclear victims, and they set up a fund of $150 million through the Nuclear Claims Tribunal. The Nuclear Claims Tribunal has come up with 37, they've added another disease, 37 disorders that are considered radiogenic, radiation-induced, radiation-caused. Uh, so the way it works is if you were in the Marshall Islands between 1946 and 1958, during the testing period when 67 tests occurred, if you were in the marshals during that period, and if you have one of these 37 disorders, you get the money. Sounds good. The problem is the $150 million is long gone. Uh, we now know the Nuclear Claims Tribunal, which is currently defunct, uh, is about $2 billion, $2 billion in arrears. So the United States owes the Marshallese $2 billion just on the nuclear claims. I would hope that would be part of the new compact negotiations as well. Um, now, let me uh, switch real quickly. I want to show Hi. you. I want to show you my uh, survey I did. Um, between 1990 and 1991, I spent 16 months in the Marshall Islands. I wanted to find out if, um, uh, if there was a problem with women, long-term effects on women and reproduction from the nuclear tests. So I set up a, a, a survey. This is the protocol I used, took a lot of information. Where were the people living? Where have they moved to? Um, have they had miscarriages, stillbirths? Are you sterile? Um, and, uh, and then all uh, problems with their children. So I collected this from 10 atolls. And these first five atolls, Rongelap, Ujjayi, Lai, these are the ones that are closest to the former nuclear test sites, uh, any we talk in Bikini. The last five are the atolls furthest away. So I, I assorted them into two clusters to see if there was a difference between women living closest to the nuclear test sites and women living furthest away. These are the data charts here. Let me show you really quickly. Now, the criterion was 1951. If you recall, it was 1952 when we detonated the first hydrogen explosion with massive radioactive fallout. Before 1952, there was virtually little or no fallout. It was not an issue. So the cutoff date was 1951 and 1952. So this is what it looked like before the fallout occurred. These are miscarriages. And you can see Millie, which is 600 miles from Bikini, Rongelap, 100 miles away, they have about the same number. So there was nothing happening before the big, radi big radioactive fallout clouds occurred. This is what happened after 1952. You see there is something going on here. There's a trend line showing that the islands closest to Bikini got um, had more miscarriages. Same thing with stillbirths and then after the fallout hit. And then what I did is combine these two. This is uh, before the fallout clouds arrived. So there's really no rhyme or reason here. This is the key slide right here. This tells you that indeed, women who live closer to the nuclear test sites were at higher risk of getting, uh, having miscarriages, stillbirths, or becoming sterile. Okay, um, now let me go back here. Let's see, where are we here? Oops, sorry. Uh, oh, oh. Hang on here. Uh, sorry, dear. Yeah. They don't see the slides advancing. Oh, you didn't see the slides. Also, you have only one minute left. Oh, okay. Uh, so people who are extremely interested in this aspect have not seen okay. the slides advancing. Let, let, me, let me finish by just bringing it up to speed here. Quadulin, can you see Quadulin here? Yeah. Okay. This is where uh, we did, new, um, this is uh, continuing. Um, where we do ballistic missile defense uh, at Kwajalein here. Oops, I'm sorry. This is messed up here. Uh, these are, uh, okay. Let me just finish up with some of the uh, current things that are happening. Uh, we have 
Can you see the flooding there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a, a sea level rise. So the Marshalls represent, uh, they're, the, they're the canaries in the coal mine. They represent the legacy of nuclear weapons testing and uh, the effects of cli uh, climate chaos. And these are actual photos of what's going on in the Marshalls uh, with climate change. Uh, Tony de Bruyne represents, uh, we, we lost a, a champion for the cause here. Tony de Bruyne is, is known internationally. He's a rock star for taking these two issues to the public, uh, nuclear legacy and climate change. Uh, this is Hilda Heine. She was our first female president in the Marshall Islands. Uh, and uh, this is her daughter who currently, as we speak, is in Glasgow arguing for climate, climate change. Uh, she's our representative at the uh, climate talks. And we have diasporas. We have about seven communities in the United States of Marshallese who have left the Marshall, Marshall Islands. There are about 100,000 Marshall Islanders total in the world. About 50,000 have left the islands. They're in places like Springdale, Arkansas, uh, about 15,000. They're in Oklahoma, they're in LA, they're in Portland, Oregon, they're in Seattle. Uh, and here in Springdale, this is one of our heroes. This is a Marshallese doctor, Dr. Sheldon Ricklin. He's currently treating the COVID patients uh, and uh, high rates of diabetes, et cetera. So um, let me just finish. Uh, I hope you would come visit my website there. And uh, there we go, that's it. End of, end, of, end of website. I have a question for you, Glenn. Uh, does your website contain, contain these slides? Yes, it does. Especially the gender, the gender related slides. Yep, it's got everything. Okay. And would you mind also sharing them with the center so people sure. can get them both on your website and if they visit the center, if they reach out to us for that? Is that okay? That's fine. Sure. You okay, because it. people are most uh, uh, eager to, to see them in detail. Mm. Uh, and we might in the future have a special, actually we are planning to have a special presentation on gender related data. Mm -hmm. So uh, those of you in the audience and Glenn would uh, please consider joining together for another a webinar focusing exactly on, on gender issues. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's very interesting and disturbing, uh, mm -hmm. as people say in the chat, all mm -hmm. of it. Yes. Sue, would you please take on, uh, 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 Glenn, would you, will you remove your shared screen so Sue can put her? Yeah. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, Robbie, would you help? What's happening? Yes, Glenn, just where it says share screen, just click on that again. I did, yeah, okay. And because Sue needs the, the screen. Yeah. Okay, give me one second. I'll try to take it off of my end. Okay, good. Hmm. Oh, great, thanks. Excellent, excellent. Sorry about that. Sue, please take the screen. Hmm. I know we've been waiting patiently, and Nabil also. <laughs> Thank you very much to the organizers and the presenters, uh, because it is very powerful material that takes a lot of absorbing. Robbie is going to uh, put my half dozen or so slides up on the screen, aren't you, Robbie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, here they are. Okay. Well done, Robbie. Thank you. Uh, I've been asking myself the question, why don't we trust the government studies of multi-generation legacy of nuclear tests in the Pacific? And I have been devoting the last 25 years to answering this question. If we could have the next slide, please, uh, Robbie. Thank you. This, my introduction, as Roger mentioned, to issues of the Pacific beyond my growing up in Australia during the nuclear test period there was in the 1980s when we were working on the Micronesian issues and we went out, Roger, his wife, and uh, a couple of other people went out to Palau for the fourth 
plebiscite, trying to get Palau to accept independence, which may sound a very odd sentence, but when you're 15,000 people and people are trying to pressure you into independence, you've got to suspect that there may be a catch to it. And the catch was that um, Palau is a very good site for nuclear submarines to birth and to submerge quickly in order to do their business around the Pacific. So it was going to be a nuclear appendage of the United States. Mm -hmm. Less said about all that, the better. You can read all about it in my book from the period, from our reports and in the current um, news items about Palau, which is, of course, a member of the United Nations, an independent nation. At the end of the 1980s, I moved to Scotland and started work in a medical school. And I had the opportunity, if we could have a look, Robbie, at the next slide, to consider what I had seen out in Palau, what I was seeing in New York. There was mention earlier of um, Micronesians coming through New York City to the Brookhaven Laboratory on Long Island, the Radiation Research Laboratory of the United States on Long Island. And I particularly remember the thyroidectomy scar, uh, scars on people's necks. And uh, you, you'd have to wonder why were so many people needing thyroidectomies after the Americans had detonated radioactive devices in their territory. So having sent myself this uh, question, I thought I'd better begin at the beginning, which unfortunately was in 1945 with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I spent four or five years moving from Scotland back to the America to look at the almost verbatim me uh, minutes of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, which was looking at the radiation impact on the human population in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I went around to these various different uh, archives and read this story of compromise, shortcutting, very poor methodology, very weak data collection, out of which was developed the basic radiation dose levels and assumptions and presumptions about mm -hmm. the possibility that there was actually a safe dose of radiation that a human could, un could take without damage, and that none of these things were going to be enduring into multi-generational damage. Mm -hmm. And having read all the written material about the studies done immediately after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I was left in 1995 um, with a question, well, how am I going to deal with this now? If this is what I've seen in the minutes, how am I going to understand it? If you could have the next slide, I found the answer in this very important book, Trust in Numbers, by Professor Theodore Porter, who has been trying to get into this session um, at my invitation several times, but has met some glitches, and I'm, all, I'm not sure that he's been able to do so. But um, Professor Porter, and I, you're, you will be getting the slides so that you can look at the detail and the data if you're interested in following up. If we could have the next slide, please, Robbie. There's so much wealth and richness in Professor Porter's analysis of the relationship between scientific advance, military advance, governmental legitimacy, and government or a collection of governments seeks to legitimize events such as these ghastly detonations that have been detailed to you in previous presentations. A most powerful statement I find is that one by Bruno Latour, all measures that didn't exist only come into existence when a new thing happens, that they need to construct a commensurability that did not exist before they existed, nor did the calibration. Now there's 20 PhD theses in that sentence alone. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to get your head around it, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing the same thing happening with COVID. 
as we saw with HIV or AIDS or any other big natural experiment where something emerges, something happens, whether it's radiation, HIV, or a new virus, and the governments are left gobsmacked trying to understand what is happening at the population level as well as the individual level. And they have to collect data. And if they don't do that honestly, we're not going to get an honest um, answer to the questions that we're asking. If you could have another slide, please, Robbie. So here's an example of Britain's or pictures of Britain's first atomic detonation 69 years ago last month, uh, October 1952 in the Montebellos. And as you can see, it wasn't the most controlled experiment mm. that you could hope for. Um, the winds sheared the, deton the bombs and the radiation in a different direction. This, these pictures are all of one detonation, I should say. Uh, so you've got a messy situation and how are you going to deal with it and understand it and reassure a population so that they will go on submitting to it? We have the next slide, please. All I was able to do was to undertake simple audits, simple arithmetic, non-inferential um, non statistics, simply to establish in a given population, which in this case was British nuclear test veterans and Australian, New Zealand, Fijian, all I could do was count the incidence, the prevalence of uh, radiogenic, possibly radiogenic conditions amongst them. And my one achievement in five years of doing all of this work at the time was that in a very simple hand study, a hand um, sorting study, my colleague Sheila Gray and I were able to detect 30% more clinically confirmed cases of multiple myeloma, myeloma a, a well-known radiogenic condition. We detected a third more cases than the National Radiation Protection Board did with a few million pounds and a data linkage methodology. There were specific reasons for why their data linkage methodology under ascertained, under identified the number of individuals had been hurt um, or possibly hurt by exposure to radiation, uh, which is spelled out in various parts of my uh, publications list, which will you can find it on my website there. Rabbit, um, Rabbit, I hasten to say, is my maiden name, and it's a very legitimate scientific name, right? <laughs> uh, rabbits in the United States, where I was born, and in Britain, and in Australia. But be sure to use two T's if you're looking for it, because otherwise you'll end up in a series of porn sites, which I did not understand when I committed to that name. The other piece of work that you might want to look at is um, one that I was invited to give in a FEST script for Roger um, in 2015, where I've listed as much data as I can, given the uh, limitations on confidentiality and so forth about personal case histories of the sort of cases that we were able to get pensions for on appeal from the Ministry of Defence in Britain and in other countries. So one of the reasons I'm saying why we don't trust government studies is because they have weak methodology at the level of under ascertaining the very, the actual numbers of a given target population of people who are uh, thought to have been possibly irradiated. If we go to the next slide, please, Robbie, um, very much looking forward to what Nabil is going to tell us in a few minutes, because that seems to be a major piece of work of exposure dose under estimation correction, if that's a sentence, in the uh, Mururoa data. I've only got one item to show you today in my limited number of minutes about what can happen to exposure dose records 
collected in the course of a person's military service when they're required to go to uh, a nuclear test site. The very last document search that I did in the British National Archives two years ago this month before the pandemic set in, I found a letter, which I'll show you in a moment, which is from the a British official in London to a British official in Australia. They're trying to supply information to the 1985 British uh, Australian Royal Commission into British nuclear tests. And they refer to a sanitized list of dose exposures of individuals in the Blue Book, which is the books that were created listing the uh, participants dose exposure. So they're saying in this letter, which if Robbie moves us forward one more, you can see if you can't read it, if you've got really good eyesight, you can see there that they're saying, um, have you got the sanitized list that we send out to you? Mm -hmm. uh, and could you tell us what's happening um, to the Australian participant list, which we seem to have lost along the way? So at various ways, in the process of the years, because this was 40 years after, 30 years after the Australian tests, even at the time the British, the Australian Royal Commission, the data were being manipulated. And I won't say any more in the two or three minutes left to us. If we could have the next uh, slide, please. Um, I'm in my 70s, I feel the pressure of the ticking time clock uh, of age hastened by COVID and a few other things. But there's still an awful lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of work that hasn't been done on the material available. The Atomic we Weapons Test Safety Committee of Australia has got dozens and dozens and dozens of minutes and other documents on the National Archives of Australia website, which have never been examined 70 years afterwards. It's more than 10,000 pages of the Royal Commission from 1985 of testimonies to the Royal Commission coming from everybody from scientists, technicians, other technical people to participants, unwilling, unhappy participants in the royal, in, in the military services to general populations, not least, uh, most importantly, in fact, the Australian Aboriginal population who was so close to the detonation that um, Glenn was referring to. They were in the more immediate radius than the, the settler population was. And what I'm trying to do is get out as much of the information that I've been able to find in various archives in the last five or six years and get it out onto my website in this ebook that uh, we're developing there to hope that other people will pick up some pointers from this information and go where nobody else has gone before. Please mm -hmm. do the information. And if we could have the next slide, which is the second last one, there's my ebook. Very sophisticated, you have to acknowledge. But let's face it, Word is a marvelous program, and all I'm trying to do is to give you the sources that I have come across. Um, and then the very last picture is if you're worried, if you have any doubt that the chaps and they were. 99.2% men who went to the tests because it was known that women were um, vulnerable to radiation damage in pregnancy, etc. But um, the the sort of experience that they have this the top picture is of a Royal Navy vessel coming down from the Montebello Islands 69 years ago, and uh, going into Fremantle Harbour in Western Australia with this sign on it. it. says radioactive keep out, it says it in Indonesian. It says it in, I think, Russian and Chinese and Japanese, just so nobody will be confused that this vessel, having been at these tests, is radioactive. 
And these are the sort of working circumstances and the men below of the sort of exposure that they may well have been exposed to in desert environments and marine environments such as Glenn was working with. So what I'm saying to you is, uh, I hope there's lots of young people in the audience, people who can lift up uh, the baton and take it forward. And if Ted Porter managed to get into the group today because he got glitched by various um, connection points, I want to thank him for the amount of thoughtfulness that has gone into his book that I'm trying to work with to understand this set of data. And thank you, Yael, for all your work in organizing today. Mm, I've got them in my heart. I feel almost guilty because there's so much to, to get into and so much to ask and so much to discuss. Uh, these uh, short webinars are important, but they're always frustrating. <laughs> That uh, please both uh, Glenn and Sue put your websites on the chat so people know to visit them. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and also please uh, send us the data to the center so it's available in both places. Uh, so you know, whoever goes to one er to one resource to one source or the other or the other will get the the information, which is so totally important. And uh, in answer for your, for your welcome for young, the younger age, we have Nabil next. <laughs> and uh, he has a story uh, that's not less disturbing, I'm afraid, if not more disturbing, or, or it's just terribly disturbing. Thank you, Yale, uh, and thanks, Roger uh, and Sue, for uh, your presentation um, uh, just just before me. Uh, I would like to um, speak very briefly today about um, the project that uh, that I initiated and have been part of, called the Moreau Files uh, Investigation to French Nuclear Tests in the Pacific, uh, and rather than um, sort of Going through uh, the, the, as 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 it already has been mentioned, these are sort of com complex, long uh, histories. Uh, I'd rather I, I, I propose to actually just take you through three of um, the cases that we uh, looked at during this uh, project. So, Moreau Files. Um, it's a project that was that I initiated uh, based at uh, the uh, NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, in, in Trondheim, where um, in Norway, where I run uh, an environmental NGO slash research uh, agency called Interpret, uh, where we use mainly new methodologies such as uh, spatial analysis, um, uh, modeling, and uh, data visualization to investigate uh, environmental destruction um, and produce evidence for um, environment against environmental crimes. So Marora Files was a project that uh, involved three groups, uh, three partners, ourselves, uh, the French uh, multimedia investigative NGO Disclose, and uh, the program on science and global security from Princeton University, um, led by um, Sebastian Philippe, um, uh, who, along with uh, Mathias Destal from Disclose, uh, were the PIs on the project. Um, and the very idea was that uh, we would use uh, the around 2,000 pages of, of declassified French defense ministry documents that, that I was able to, um, that, that were shared with me uh, by the, the late uh, Bruno Barrio, who has been uh, a champion and, and, uh, of the nuclear, the legacy of um, the politics and the history of the nuclear weapons testing in France. Uh, Number of years ago, when uh, I, I, I had a chance to visit French Polynesia and, on, uh, as a researcher, um, so for around five years uh, after that, um, I had been trying to find the right team to take on this task, uh, and it was possible um, to do this 
after after trying and knocking on many doors and and, and speaking to a lot of people during this period. Uh, and the project involved uh, by not by coincidence, but um, Sebastian Philippe from Princeton, who is a, a nuclear uh, expert. Um, we also wanted to be able to visualize and spatialize this, the, the, the data that uh, was coming from these documents, uh, which was our responsibility. Um, and uh, we, we had on our team the journalists who would do more on the ground investigations uh, in cooperation with many civil society organizations in the Pacific. Um, the output of the project uh, what is an interactive online platform, which I'll share the link with you all today, but also um, a series of publications um, and, uh, and um, a series of videos. So the project, uh, you know, just very briefly, the, there were 193 tests uh, that took place in French Polynesia between 66 and 96. Uh, and 41 of these were atmospheric uh, tests that took place between 1966 and 1974, and uh, um, which were centered around the atolls of Mururu and Fangatufa, uh, but their impacts uh, uh, went, went all over the, this vast territory of French Polynesia, and in fact, in many places in the, in the global south. Um, the project uh, used, the, so, uh, so we used this data and uh, the three examples from three tests that I will uh, go through very quickly, uh, basically have a pattern, right? That how the French state lied to the Polynesian people. Uh, and uh, uh, what, we, what we did was actually use their own data to turn it around against them, right? And uh, we said that we could use these new tools of presenting this information um, in, in, you know, in, that could work in both a, um, legal and, 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 and other forums. Uh, so the first test that we looked at was Aldebaran, the very first test that the French conducted in 1966. Uh, and in this case, uh, as we have already heard before, um, uh, you know, on the left hand, for example, side, you see how the, uh, the French government, the, 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 um, began to test with the uh, assumption that the direction of the wind would flow in one direction. But in fact, what we see on the right hand side is uh, a visualization of uh, the wind direction that they themselves calculated um, uh, uh, not very long before the tests, yet they conducted the tests anyway. This is how the first French test begins. Um, what we did in this case was um, um, uh, use uh, a method called atmospheric transport modeling uh, to reconstruct. Uh, this is the, the scientific uh, work was led by Sebastian. Um, uh, what we did was we reconstructed the fallout of this uh, test um, uh, from the period of the test over the next um, couple of days uh, by, by uh, using an algorithm to launch uh, about 300,000 particles uh, you know, in space and time um, using the um, weather data that we could, we could uh, uh, get a hold of. And a lot of this data from the, from the documents where uh, we used both uh, sort of computer vision techniques, but also uh, literally going through uh, hundreds of pages of data to actually transcribe and, and bring them into, and clean them up and bring them into, into our um, sort of uh, 3D environments and so on. All of this data and the, and the documents are on the platform uh, that uh, you can also visit. Um, so in this case, we were able to demonstrate that the, the, the impacts of the tests were, um, had reached what you see here is the, uh, um, the Gambier Atoll uh, in uh, French Polynesia. Uh, and part of this work was to then um, uh, try to reconstruct what we called uh, cancer clusters in the Gambia Islands. We could not demonstrate uh, a direct relationship between the tests and the health impacts, but, uh, but the idea was to begin to piece together, right, testimonies of, of people and, uh, and by, by speaking to uh, various um, organizations and, and, and so on to try to get a picture of what had happened. So this is, um, so of course, this 
area was was uh, attacked with uh, nuclear weapons uh, that test many, many times since. So this is cumulative, right? Not just the impact of, of that first test. Uh, a second example is uh, a test that took place uh, in 1971 that we reconstructed called Ancelot. Uh, and th this tests a uh, similar story uh, that uh, given the weather conditions at the time, um, uh, the French military knew that uh, the, 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 this um, Torea, uh, which is again, not very far from Aurora, which was populated at the time, would be uh, showered by this radiation moving through rain and clouds. Yet not only did they not uh, tell the uh, people that were living there, um, we found documents uh, in the archives or in these declassified documents where they in fact were, um, uh, uh, they were measuring the, the levels of radiation in drinking water cisterns in the community and were listing the, the children who were drinking this uh, water. Uh, not only did they, 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 they did nothing to uh, warn these, these families, but they were in fact being um, uh, watched. Uh, we, we could not make the trip to Turea because of the uh, uh, of the COVID restrictions uh, last summer, but uh, we uh, Thomas uh, Statius, our, the investigative journalist, was uh, working on the project and co-author of the book Toxic with Sebastian Philippe. Uh, we were able to through through Thomas able to uh, track down Maoake Brander, who is um, whose family members were on that list, and he had not seen this document or had any knowledge of 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 what the French state knew. So this was yet another example of uh, uh, what uh, was going on at the time. The third example, and which is what I will end with, uh, is the Centaur test from 1974. This is uh, very much towards the uh, end of the atmospheric uh, tests, as Roger uh, mentioned, until the tests moved underground. And in this case, we were um, able to show that um, uh, Again, contrary to what the official uh, uh, position had, remains to this day, what you see here, for instance, on the on the bottom right, is the um, uh, the uh, reconstruction of the spread of the radiation fallout that the French uh, state uh, conducted. Uh, however, uh, what we did was using our uh, new methodologies. We we were able to run and visualize the um, the ship movement of the fallout past the, the time period that the uh, French state officially um, just managed to, 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 to show. And we were able to demonstrate that in fact, the fallout um, reached the most populated parts of Tahiti uh, in, in um, um, population at this time over 80, 87,000. And that in fact, uh, this uh, fallout from this radiation had uh, made an impact uh, over 100,000 people in uh, th this, th this place, right? And uh, the radiation levels that they received were, um, uh, the exposure that they received were, were even under French uh, calculations higher than um, what, what was permissible or what for which they would have received uh, compensation. However, I'd like to end with the simple fact that, um, that to this day, uh, we can number, we can count, you know, in our hands, the number of people that have received any kind of compensation uh, from the impacts of the French tests. And in many ways that our project um, very much dedicated to Bruno Bayou uh, has tried to um, use the, the, the new techniques in our hand to, to bring a new um, level of, of uh, detail to this, uh, to this fight. Um, the, after the, uh, um, the, the release of this report, which was uh, reported on by the global media, um, there has been um, uh, continuing efforts, uh, as we know how difficult and long-term these are to, um, to seek uh, new kinds of reparations. Uh, so I'll just uh, end with uh, this here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nabil, and thank you for, for keeping to the time. So it gives us a tiny bit of time to, <laughs> to respond to the audience. In general, to let 
to let everyone know, uh, we'd send an email to everyone here after the event with all the website links, uh, the chat uh, uh, questions and answers, and the video files. So uh, it, it, you will have this. Don't get all crazed about, about that. Um, I'm wondering, there are really very few question question besides a uh, question for this information and further information, except there's one question that I thought maybe we can uh, look at because it has to do with prevention. How can what you have learned prevent the Japanese government from dumping 1 million to 80,000 million tons of radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear accident into the Pacific Ocean. This was uh, asked by Pete Catherine Skopik. Any ideas? Uh, very, very expert panelists. Anyone is willing? Uh, uh, Sue, would you please? Yes. I, mean, yeah, I think I've unmuted myself. I cannot answer that question, uh, but I can remind ourselves about the old saw that um, if we don't understand our history, it will repeat itself. The British tests in Australia were designed to develop the H bomb that was eventually detonated off Kiribati. They had to be concluded before the opening of the 1956 Melbourne Olympic Games, which were due um, east of the westerly dominant wind pattern, bringing radiation from middle Australia to eastern Australia, where Melbourne is situated as well as the other major cities. The British government and the Australian government persisted in accepting and undertaking progressively thermonuclear tests of component parts until exactly one month before the Melbourne Olympics opened in November 1956. Just a nice time for the radiation fallout which of course didn't happen according to official resources, um, entered the food chain in time for the humans who congregated in the Melbourne cricket ground to perhaps eat them on their hot dogs or burgers or whatever. So I'm saying that when Fukushima uh, exploded, we didn't hear that the Tokyo Olympics were going to be postponed because of possible radiation exposure. Um, we heard that I think it was the baseball events were going to be held in the territory of Fukushima itself. Mm -hmm. um, and Roger's looking a bit surprised, <laughs> but it's true. I read it in the newspaper, it must be true. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, the governments, when they have other interests, have no compunction, it would seem, about what they allow to happen, even at human hazard or animal hazard. Um, I think in a way, Miraroa was the worst case of repeated, 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 as Nabil has shown us, human exposure to detonations for military interests. But I'm getting onto my soapbox, so I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> uh, there was one more question that I simply can say yes to about whether there's still uh, incidents of, of uh, miscarriages and um, inherited cancers. The answer, uh, tragically, is yes. And it's not only in the Marshall Islands. Uh, 
And we find those incidences from second to third generations too. Um, I would like to add something uh, from my uh, perspective of uh, being a psychologist and a psychosocial expert, um, that we are now uh, studying the psychosocial aspects of multi-generational legacies of trauma with these populations. Um, and I hope uh, you, you will be of help in, help in getting out the word and in helping us distribute it as, as widely as possible. Um, so we have a lot more work to do. We have a lot more webinars to organize. And I would like to ask the audience and our esteemed panelists to suggest future related webinars. Uh, and so uh, because we have run out of time, I would like the audience, as I promised, first of all, I really apologize, but it seems and we didn't really have time to reflect on the emotions that this panel uh, triggered either. Um, but we'll keep going. Uh, uh, so we don't have time for further questions and answers, but we do have time for last words from the panelists. Uh, how do you, what would you like the next webinar to be on? Even if it's after, even after 10, number 10 from now, where should we go from here? Uh, we go in the same order. Uh, the ambassadors had to speak with the president. Uh, we understand, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure she'll remain in touch. Uh, we'll go in the same order, so you'll have time to reflect. Uh, Roger, where do we go from here? Uh, I, I don't have any great uh, idea for your next webinar, but I must say what a pleasure it was uh, to work with everybody. What an incredible range of perspectives on one of the evils uh, of the last century or so. Uh, and I do hope all of us will reflect on how we can go about uh, persuading our own countries to become party to the treaty on the prevention of nuclear weapons or they haven't already become a, a, a party so, a, to it, how we get the word out about how important that is. And also, as, as I hinted, I, I think it's really important to, uh, to think through uh, how we're going to respond to articles uh, six and seven of the TPNW and the question of uh, victims, personal victims and uh, the environment uh, that has suffered uh, through testing. And of course, uh, from the original bombs at Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, there is uh, so much to it. I, I, I confess, that I spent a lifetime uh, thinking about these issues. I first started thinking about them in, in the context of proposals for French testing in the Pacific. I mean, you all know the story. The French began their tests in Algeria and having been unceremoniously booted out of there, uh, they came uh, to the uh, uh, Pacific neighborhood. And I will remember being on a panel in uh, uh, Europe when we were talking about some of these issues and, and, and a representative of France said, essentially, well, uh, uh, who cares? Nobody lives there. And I said, well, you know, I do uh, part of my life. Uh, and I have a lot of friends there. Uh, and uh, we got out a map and it pointed out where Micronesia was, Polynesia was, uh, Melanesia. Uh, and there are people, real people uh, affected uh, by this. And, and it's very important to think through all of those uh, kinds of issues about what we do next. And as it's just some of you said prevention is, is so important. Treaties help, but treaties can't guarantee uh, that you'll do it. Uh, I thought it was important to have a crack at the litigation in the International Court of Justice. Yeah, we came up short really every time of what we really wanted to get out of it. But 
it was, it was something, something you can do in your professional capacity. And uh, I'm so glad that other people are doing such wonderful things like Neville in their professional capacity and, and so on. So thank you. Uh, Glenn, would you share with us your thought? Yes, um, I, I'm just hoping that uh, the young generation can take all of our information and use it for activism uh, to launch us into a, into a post-nuclear world. Um, the evidence is critical. There's so much overwhelming evidence, but um, I, I, I teach undergrads and uh, I know that the concern of most young people, say between 18 and 24, is the environment, uh, what's happening in Scotland at Glasgow right now. Uh, so nukes are a part of that environment, and I would hope that young people would embrace all of the collective information that we've pulled together here uh, to move ahead and to just finally just get rid of these damn weapons. Uh, finally, um, I've been working with the Marshall Islanders for 45 years since I was a Peace Corps volunteer, um, and um, I've, I've condensed it down to a, a small meme, a, a, a memorable meme. The meme is, um, or the trope, is America nuked the gentle people. America nuked the gentle people. So I'll end with that. I knew you'd make me cry at some point. <laughs> Sue? Ambassador, I noticed you visited us and left again, but if you'd be there to say the last word, that would be marvelous. Sue, go ahead. Well, thank you, but I think I've, I've said my pulpit piece, which is, here's the baton, get on with it. And, but also, it's very important to remember that with radiation, it's not going away after 70 years. It's not as if something happened and it's been cleaned up um, ecologically, environmentally, physically, or politically. It's there toxicating everything still. And, um, it, it shouldn't be something of the grandfathers, but it should be worrying about what the grandchildren are going to have to put up with. And they've got an awful lot on their plate coming down the tubes, if that's not a dreadful mixture of metaphors, um, with the things that we know about already. But there's a huge amount of work undone in Australia, Kiribati, it's alone, in those incidents alone. And I'm sure Nabil and Glenn would say about the other territories too. Mm -hmm. And that takes us to Nabil. <laughs> Your vision. Uh, thank, thanks again to uh, everyone for such an um, amazing panel. It's, it's a real honor to be, to, to, to be with you uh, and speaking together. Um, I was just thinking uh, about the, this word trauma, and, uh, and 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 in a way, it's also uh, maybe about multi generational resistance uh, that that has been uh, going on uh, and and will continue, um, and and how uh, let's say uh, I mean it's a question I have to think about, like how do we actually use um, new tools to, to uh, um, in this in these old fights uh, and and in a way uh, um, uh, in a way it, uh, it takes a, a, a tremendous um, sort of time and, and effort but uh, but but I think it'd be it, it's something that we're, we're constantly working on how to um, you know we might be far away from some of these places right but then how to Stay engaged and and and, uh, um, uh, and, and be uh, working on these issues in the in the long term. Uh, and that's something that um, well, uh, I'm, I've just even here today. I've learned tremendous amount from all of you. So uh, thank you again. Thanks. So have I. I don't. I, I really don't have words, but. Uh, I thank you from the bottom of my being uh, in the name of the center. Um, to let everyone know, we do have a working group in the center on multi-generational legacies of nuclear radiation and fallout. And anyone who would like to join, please write to us directly. Roger is at least a co-chair of it or... <laughs> 
if not the chair. <laughs> and uh, please stay in touch. Uh, you have enriched all of us, even though it hurt, it's difficult knowledge. But I believe you have inspired us to continue uh, both in the work of prevention and in, in the work toward the prevention of nuclear weapons. So it's hard to say goodbye, <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you so much. Until the next webinar. <laughs>